Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar for World Services for the Blind. My name is Heather Miller, and I'm the Director of Education and Training here at WSB. And I think everybody is very excited today about the subject matter for this month's webinar. We have three of the biggest names in blind technology joining us today from Envision, Be My Eyes, and Eyes. And they're going to be talking about their apps and a little bit of their history and the future of assistive technology. And so if everybody could make sure that you remain muted during this webinar, we want everyone to be able to hear everything that's going on. And if you have any questions as we proceed through the webinar, please put them in the chat and then we will get to as many of those at the end as we possibly can, time permitting. So to start us out today, I would like our three panelists to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about the history of their companies and the apps that they promote. So first we will go over to Karthik from Envision. Are you muted, Karthik? Oh, sorry, he uh, muted himself. Um, and we have to. Yes, thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much, everyone, uh, Yale, for having me on. I'm super excited uh, to you know, like be on here and to talk a bit more about origins of Envision, but also explain what we're doing right now and also give people a glimpse into the future, maybe. Uh, so my name is, is Karthik. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder of Envision. Uh, Envision is something that we started about you know, five and a half years back. Um, uh, and it started more as a as a thesis you know, of mine when I was a student. I was a master's student in the Netherlands. I was doing a project which was looking into how to increase independence for people who are you're blind or have a low vision. Uh, the motivation for that to pick up as a thesis in the first place began from a visit I did to a blind school in India, uh, where I was mainly there to talk about what are the job opportunities students could have in the future. And I was just talking to a group of people and I was explaining to them that a designer is just somebody who solves a problem. So if all of you are able to uh, build a solution to a problem that you face, all of you could become a designer in the future. And towards the end of my talk, I asked a question to all the kids in the room. I said, hey, if all of you were to become a designer tomorrow, what would be the problems that all of you would like to solve? And uh, almost all the kids in the room that day were like, I want to be more independent. You know, like I want to be able to go to school on my own, I want to be able to hang out with my friends, I want to be able to pick up a book and just I read and just I didn't, you know, and just like read a book by myself. So this independence was like such a strong emotion they all wanted to experience, and that whole thing really stuck with me. So I came back to my you know, like university. I spoke to a you know like a professor of mine, and I said, "Hey, this is something that I want to do as a thesis." And in the beginning, it was purely a research. Uh, endeavor for me. I was just you know going around and speaking to as many of the blind and a uh, you know tech, uh, people that I could talk to to understand you know, what is independence for them. Like you know, like you know, what do they mean when they say the word independence? And something I understood early on was that for a lot of them, independence almost always meant access to information. And because of the fact that you know, so much of the information around us, because it, it happens to be in a visual form. Uh, the inability to you know the inability to access that is the, the thing that is causing the dependencies in their lives. Uh, for example, when we are walk into a train station, you know the information is up there, but because it happens to be a visual information, uh, we can't access it and we have to ask someone else for help. But at the same time, I also understood that it's a bit impractical to expect all the information around you to change. You cannot really go and put a braille stickers on everything around you. So it was at that point I started to take a look into how can the technologies of today, like AI and image, image recognition, how can are they be used to extract information from existing uh, images and infrastructure without having to you know, change the infrastructure itself? Um, it started with very uh, you know, like you know, your simple stuff. We built like a very simple object, a recognition which will tell you this is a cup, this is a plate. 
uh, and uh, we took that to a user group of you know, people and we said, hey, this is what the AI can offer you as information. And then there's a user group will start offering us your feedback. They said, hey, you know what? It, it, it's not helpful to tell me there's a cup, uh, but if you can you know, let me know what does the cup say? Is it a blue cup? Is it you know, the cup that I drink out of? That's more helpful. So we took their feedback and we kept on iteratively improving on the feedback. And towards the end of my thesis, we had you know, you know, built an application which uh, actually had a suite of different AI uh, features that could you know, read text, that could give a description of a scene around them, that could give a description of objects around them. And when we started to just show that uh, prototype around, people got very excited about it. They felt that, hey, this is actually an application that is actually uh, helpful to them in their everyday life and something that uh, is you know, so good that they'll be okay to, you know, like to pay for it. So I think it was at that point we came to a realization that we are probably on to something here. Uh, and this you know, tool that we have built, if we if we want it to be out in the hands of all the blind and low vision people in the world, we need to build a business model around it. We need to make sure that it is sustainable and scalable. And that's sort of how the transition from a start from you know, like a project to a startup you know, you know, began. Uh, and you know, like we launched our iOS app uh, in subsequent year and did you know, go on to launch the Android app uh, like, uh, you know, like a year after that. And over the year, the apps have grown. Uh, in the beginning, they were a subscription based app. But uh, you know, like last year, you know, like we made both our iOS and Android app available completely for free for everyone in the world. Uh, and our apps are now the most used app uh, by people who are like blind or like low vision around the world. It's a bit like a Swiss knife with all of these different AI functions all you know, built into one. And in addition to the app, now we also have a, you know, like a smart glass based a solution, which offers all of those uh, amazing uh, features and a lot more, but in a hands-free and unobtrusive way. So that's a bit about the journey of Envision from the beginnings to you know, so far. All right, thank you so much. That was definitely very interesting. Um, we also have with us today Hans from Be My Eyes. Hans, would you mind introducing yourself? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Hans and I am the founder of Be My Eyes. Uh, I live here in Denmark and I am visually impaired myself. And um, way back in 2012, <laughs> I was uh, working for the Danish Blind Association or the Danish uh, Blind Federation. Um, and in that period of time, I came up with this idea that we could make an app for uh, blind people where you could just press a button and then you could uh, get access to uh, sighted volunteers uh, like a FaceTime call. Um, I had no idea how to make an app or anything, um, but I kind of thought this was maybe a, a good idea. Uh, and I went to a uh, startup weekend where I presented this idea and then, and I was lucky to find uh, some other people who thought, oh, that, that's a great idea. Let's uh, have a look at that. And, um, it's, it's a very long story, <laughs> but we ended up raising some money and we ended up uh, hiring some developers. And then uh, in uh, 2000, in January 2015, we were able to launch our first version of Be My Eyes, where you as a blind person, you can simply launch the Be My Eyes app and you tap one button and then we will automatically connect you to a sighted volunteers speaking your language, uh, most likely living in, in your time zone. Um, and it's completely free. Uh, and this is also a super important thing about uh, Be My Eyes. Um, and, and what 
what we found was that um, most people are really good at being blind people. So they don't need that much help, but sometimes they need a little bit of help. Um, and it is it can be kind of troublesome to, um, to find out who to make this uh, FaceTime call to ask about something. Uh, so the, the, the fact that you can just press a button and you don't have to think about who to call, you can, you can simply just request a pair of eyes. Uh, that was kind of you know, intriguing to a, a lot of the people. Um, and we also found that uh, the volunteers were super excited about being able to be a volunteer in a super easy way. You just have to download the app and say, uh, yeah, I might be available. You don't even have to be available. You don't have to tell when you are available because uh, when a blind person requests a call, uh, uh, help, then uh, we will send out a notification to 20 volunteers simply because we don't know what, what they are doing. Um, so, and the first of those 20 volunteers who said yes will be connected to uh, the blind or low vision user. Um, so it's a super convenient way, both as a, a blind user, but also as a volunteer to, to, to get connected in this way. Um, and we were to totally blown away by the interest from, from day one and, and uh, uh, from the 2015 to, to today, uh, we have uh, now uh, more than half a million blind and low vision people signed up and six and a half million people has agreed to be uh, volunteers. Uh, we can connect people in uh, 185 different uh, languages. Um, it's super important that you as a uh, Farsi speaking uh, blind person can get uh, help in your native language. Um, so so that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. And, and many of our volunteers speak more than one language and you can kind of uh, add a second or third language if you want to. Uh, and that is how we can uh, support people in pretty much whatever language uh, at whatever time, uh, because we, we pretty much always have somebody in another time zone. I mean, if you if, if I wake up at two o'clock at night and I need to see something, and then I, I can just tap the button and and we will find someone who speaks Danish, uh, but we do not call anyone in Denmark at two o'clock at night. Um, so we, we simply find someone in another time zone. Um, and that is how we can support uh, people 24 seven without disturbing uh, people uh, 24 seven. Um, so, so that is uh, what we have been doing for uh, now uh, eight years. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of things that I could talk about, but, but I will jump to our latest uh, uh, adventure, you can say, uh, because in February this year, we got a call from OpenAI um, and, uh, and they asked us if we wanted to launch a new feature together with them. Um, and we were very excited about it. Um, and the feature is that you can take a, a still picture uh, with your phone and then it automatically gets uploaded to OpenAI and you get a very detailed description back of your, uh, your picture. Um, and, and then you can say, oh, well, uh, any volunteer can do that. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but maybe you don't really feel like talking to a volunteer. Maybe it's too early Monday morning and you are not ready for any uh, human beings. Um, so, so, so now you can, you can take this photo and you can get a detailed description. And not only that, you can, you can further ask questions to the picture, so to speak. Uh, let's say you, 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 get a, 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 you take a picture of uh, some food ingredients and then uh, you can, uh, okay, this is pasta. Yeah, but what kind of pasta? How, how many minutes does this pasta need to cook? And can you give me a recipe where I can use this kind of pasta? And, and, and I also have broccoli. Can, can you make a recipe with that? And, and it will actually do it. Um, and that's, that's a totally amazing thing. Um, and also you can get uh, very detailed descriptions of um, the sceneries, um, like your, your garden or uh, the, the, down the road where you're living or something like that. Um, and and it, it has some uh, 
uh, amazing uh, capabilities that we are uh, exploring right now. Um, when I say you can do it, it doesn't really mean you can do it because we have a, a, a rather large beta testing group that are testing this because this is absolutely uh, new technology and, and we need to be super, super careful because it um, it's very convincing when it says, yeah, this is uh, then, and sometimes it, it's not uh, absolutely correct. And we are working with open AI in how we can improve the, the algorithms to uh, at least know when, when it's not uh, correct or, or, and how we can improve the, uh, the, the model that is doing this. Um, we're super proud that we are the only company, uh, not only the only uh, blindness company, but the only company uh, at all that are using open AI's uh, image to text model. Um, I, I think basically nobody really knew that they were working on, on, on such a technology. Um, so um, yeah. The, the, the blind people is actually in the forefront of this whole uh, AI uh, technology right now because of uh, Be My Eyes has gotten access uh, to, to this uh, technology, which we are super excited about. Uh, and I'm super happy to answer questions about um, yeah, pretty much whatever. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hans. And I think we can all appreciate that sometimes it's just too early to talk to another human being. So we appreciate <laughs> y'all looking out for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, we also have Michael from Eyes joining us. And I'd like him to introduce himself and tell us a little about their app. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Heather. Pleasure to, to meet you all. Um, I'm Michiel, or, or please call me in English also Michael. Because originally I'm from Belgium, but I'm now in the new, in in New York in uh, in the US. So telling you or taking you a bit more, uh, and it's almost two years ago that we uh, founded our business, which is called Eyes, and that's spelled A Y E S. The main reason, let's say, why we we uh, got into the assistive technology space is that, of course, that we have a blind family friend in Belgium, um, who from or from who we actually learned the challenges uh, when it comes down to outdoor mobility, because that was really the initial focus that we had. Um, so talking to Kenny, which is our blind friend two years ago, we, we learned one of the, let's say crucial challenge, and I would even argue one of the most critical ones is being able to safely cross a signalized intersection. Um, and of course, these days through O&M skills, you can listen to traffic, uh, but sometimes there's no traffic, so it becomes a little harder. Um, and at the same time, actually talking to Kenny, our friend, but also numerous of other people that we were in touch with back in Belgium and some of them in the Netherlands as well. We also learned from the other side of things that a lot of cities generally all over the world uh, are not accessible yet uh, when it comes down to those uh, pedestrian signals. And of course, what we've learned, what we what, what I didn't know that well before is a city usually installs an audible physical uh, signal which generally conveys uh, the status of whether you can walk or you don't walk but generally these solutions um, i would say are yeah between 10 to 20 percent of all intersections do have those audible signals installed just generally all over the world um, some cities do a better job at it uh, i think scandinavia is, is one of the bigger better ones uh, in the world, but generally we we've learned on the other side of things that it's also very expensive to, for cities to install these and that there's some sort of like bottleneck and um, I was working and, and myself I'm, I'm a computer scientist I'm an AI uh, engineer by trade and so does my other two co-founders um, and I was actually working in uh, another startup that was teaching trains to drive autonomously and it was also like matching the stories that we had from our friends, matching the stories that we received from cities. And then uh, the fact that I was working in, in the autonomous uh, driving uh, sector, we actually uh, had the idea, for example, if a self-driving uh, self car can drive autonomously on the highway for like 50 to 60 miles an hour, why can't we use similar techniques to guide blind and low vision pedestrians across a street whether it's a sidewalk or a crosswalk at three or four miles an hour. And that was actually one of the main drivers into developing our main product, which is called OKO. OK -O. 
And basically what OCO does is uh, similarly to a physical audible signal, we convey uh, what the status is of the pedestrian signal. And here in the United States, um, that is the walk signal, which is a white walking person or the don't walk signal, which is a red hand. And mostly in Europe, uh, it's a bit different. There, the walk signal is a green man and the don't walk signal is a red man. Jenny, what we do is we leverage the smartphone back camera and our in-house developed AI to visually interpret the pedestrian signal and bring that information to the end user in three types of feedback. Um, so for every other uh, status, the walk signal, the don't walk signal, and here in the US, you have even a third one, which is countdown. We provide a differentiable feedback um, in three, three ways, one of which is an audible cue. The second one is a vibration cue. And the third one is a visual cue. So there's a visual overlay uh, on the screen indicating whether the walk or don't walk signal is on. And the feedback is, is let's say, pretty uh, intuitive, uh, which is similarly to yeah, the physical audible signal. For example, um, a very fast beep to indicate walk and a very slow beep to indicate the don't walk signal. And originally, we, we of course, started off by developing the app uh, in Belgium. I think it took us about six months from initial development to uh, a full beta test uh, for about three months to then uh, officially launch it in the App Store in Belgium. Um, so that's been like a year and a half ago. And then uh, fast forwarding a bit uh, into, the, into time, about three or four months ago now, we, we actually launched uh, or launched our OCO app here in the United States because uh, we saw even a bigger need for our product. Uh, since a lot of cities, unfortunately, here in the US, uh, do not have those uh, audible signals installed. Um, and ultimately, what a lot of people uh, see as value in our product is that they now have a tool within their iPhone that utilizes them to just go and explore everywhere and be able to get the status of the signal, which is such a crucial, crucial information, um, and get across uh, the street. I do need to say, of course, and it's something that I really want to emphasize to all, it's not that we're replacement of any O&M skills or a guide dog or a white cane. Uh, although we're focused on outdoor mobility, it's something or our tool, our assistive tool, is always something that you should be uh, or that you should use in conjunction with any other uh, skill that you may have. Um, but ultimately, it's pretty great. And the, the past three months also showed us uh, great value here in the US. I think in only two, uh, sorry, the last three months, our technology has helped cross 200,000 streets alone here in the US, which is an amazing amount. And there's a lot of people uh, that are just yeah, downloading, downloading the app because that's also a good thing. The app is for free for the end user because um, also, also from day one, the, we had the vision that um, whether it's for the, the service that we now provide or just basically anything that will come to the app. Um, if a sighted person, for example, doesn't need to pay to look at the traffic light, nor should a blind or low vision pedestrian. Um, and that's why we're from the belief that we should enable our technology for free for the end user um, and try to partner up with cities or healthcare institutions, which we've been doing in Belgium quite successfully. Um, but now it's something that we're also uh, setting aside here in the United States. Um, so yeah, the, the the past months have been great. Uh, I'm already here ten weeks in uh, in the US, uh, talking to a lot of people, both here in New York, uh, but just generally all over the US, uh, then virtually. Um, so I think, given that the technology is rather new, um, I would open. I mean, or please go ahead in the audience if there's any question. Uh, I'm happy to answer it. Um, also regarding the fact, like where our technology is moving uh, ahead in uh, in time. Thank you very much, Michael. And this is definitely something that I think we can all agree it's pretty useful because I know even when there are audible crossing signals, sometimes when you're in a busy downtown area with a lot of traffic, it's difficult to hear even if that audible crosswalk mm -hmm. system is actually installed. So this can be yeah. very useful, you know, whether there's those actual accessible crosswalks or not. So yeah, thank indeed, you yeah. very much. I yeah, I totally agree. If I can add a, a small sentence, it's something that we we noticed not only in Belgium, 
but also just generally here in, in the US, due to the fact that it's hardware and, and you need to maintain it, these things or devices tend to break, break of course, which is normal. Um, but it's also, uh, yeah, the responsibility from a city to properly maintain them. Um, and actually it's, it's one of my hobbies these days to always push a certain pedestrian push button if I see it, just to remind myself to what extent these devices are always working. Um, so indeed, in, even in scenarios where there is an APS, um, a lot of people also use our technology um, for ease of use or, or just whenever it's not properly working. Cool. Well, good to know. Well, maybe I something. Have a question. <laughs> sure. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Now that I think about it, I think it's um, something that I haven't mentioned, and that I think that's pretty good to to point that out as well, uh, which is, I, in my belief, pretty unique. Uh, but all the, the artificial intelligence that we do happens on the phone itself. Um, and in, in a sense, that means that you can use our technology wherever you're going, even if you're in an airplane mode uh, status. So that means there's no requirement of any Wi-Fi nor a setter connection. And I think even more importantly here in the US, where there's tall skyscrapers or just dead zones in general, uh, where we from day one had to believe that we shouldn't rely on setter connections to uh, process technology or process information in a real-time environment because you don't want to wait for a couple of seconds to know what the status is of that traffic light of course and so to ensure that reliability everything happens uh, on the phone so that's an addition that i forgot to mention but it's pretty important of course awesome well i would like to ask all three of you kind of a little circle back around to karthik but in light of um, how you've developed your software and your programs and your apps to this point, kind of how do you see the future of AI as it's being used in blind technology going forward as we see improvements over the years? I, I can start if you guys like, but I'm going to go sure, ahead as well. Ahead, but Michael. All right, super, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's needless to say that, of course, given with the uh, the developments of OpenAI and ChatGPT, um, and just generally the rise of AI that there's just generally uh, more trust in AI, I would say, or let's say to start with that. Um, generally speaking from my uh, focus is that our company is more focused on the visual aspect and the outdoor mobility. So I, I would more mostly like focus on that. And I think the other two will focus on that, uh, on their specific region as well. But I think in, a, in our scenario, you're, there's a lot of visual information when traveling around that you can interpret with a certain AI that is developed. I think um, where we want to set out is that we want to do stuff that is very critical to a certain uh, person. And one of them, of course, is being able to safely cross. But imagine that you can also... Um, know where the crosswalk is, whether there's a stop sign. Um, I mean, there's so many, I think, millions of millions of things that you would like to. I think for our company and our vision is really, it's one thing to be able to detect it, but it's another thing to really make sure that it's being, that it's intuitive brought back to the end user, such that it's not too verbose in a sense that it's yeah just providing too much information of your surroundings. Uh, so that's always like an interesting trade-off for us. Uh, to one, being able to develop it, but then also to know how to properly uh, get a great user experience. So I'm, I'm definitely very much interested and excited into uh, what we and, and others in the space are going to do with AI, because I think the possibilities are endless. Uh, but I think it's always um, good as well to think about the user experience behind it, which is then, of course, non-AI. And I'm also from the belief that not every problem should be solved with AI. It can be an enabler, but it's not just the holy grail, let's say, for any other uh, solution. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Karthik, do you have something to say about yeah. that question? No, yeah, definitely. I think we've been in this space for about, you know, like six years now. So we have sort of you know, seen how these AI models start evolving. There's always like a hype cycle when there's something new and then it dies down and then it becomes more you know, broadly adopted. Uh, but I think uh, also like you're know, you know, you know, you know, listening to what your Hans and what 
Oliver Michael has already mentioned. I think I you know see in in a future AI becoming um, you're like more interactive and AI becoming more of a more more like generic as well. So I think these are the two directions I see the AI growing into. And let me explain what each of those your know, terms mean. Right? I think AI is going to become more interactive which means it's going to be easier for people to interact with these AIs for stuff they, you know, like they want out of it. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, sort of like rise of like chat GPT is a great example of that, where something like a GPT already existed, right? Like that kind of, uh, AI uh, sort of models already existed, but with something like a chat GPT, where you can have, you're know, like a chat with an AI and just to have an interaction in a natural human tech language that is you know, what has you know sort of propelled the success of something like a chat gpt i think that's the way ai is going to be in the future where you don't have to you know like learn what are the commands you need to give it you don't have to like learn what are the buttons you need to press or what is a gesture you need to do you need to just talk to this ai as if you're talking to a sighted you know not, not a person who is next to you and the ai will do the heavy lifting of understanding what you need and offer you that information, right? So for example, uh, recently we pushed a feature on the glasses called Ask Envision, where after you scan a document, you can simply ask a question of the document. And in that we do use uh, GPT-4 on the backend to be able to you know, sort of process the answers. So for example, if you have a menu, you just scan a menu, and then you simply ask for like, you know, for something like, something like what are you know, you know, the appetizers in the menu? And it only speaks of the appetizers to you. You can ask it for how much is the ice cream, right? And it will you know, like read through the menu and only you know like a, like, like a give you the answer to that. So this kind of a faster access to information is enabled by interactivity, where now you don't have to you know, you read the whole or like menu, you know, like sort of line by line, which you otherwise will have to do if you only are interested in the ice cream. You can just ask AI a question like you would ask if there was a sighted a person who is next to you. So I think that interactivity is a big thing that we're going to you know, start uh, seeing as a big uh, you know like next step in terms of AI. And I think that will be combined with a generic AI, which is sort of like you know, like one AI to like rule them all kind of an AI, right? So right now um, you have an AI to recognize text, an AI to recognize objects, an AI to recognize your faces. You know, you know, one that will like recognize like banknotes. All of these are different sort of like modules. People probably have different apps for that, or people have Envision app. And inside of the app, there are different uh, different uh, functions that are doing all of these things differently. But what we're trying to do at Envision is we're trying to you know, sort of combine all of this and build a general AI where you can just ask it anything, and the AI will figure out which, which is the model it needs to bring up to give you the answer to it, right? So if you, you if you if you sort of probably just take a picture of anything that is in front of you, and after that you ask it a question. So if you are holding a banknote, it will automatically you recognize what is the banknote that you're holding and like uh, give you the give you like give you like a give you like, a, give, you like a, give you like a denomination. If there is a person in front of you whom you know, it will all automatically go ahead and it will offer you the you know, like name of that person. I think that's the kind of generic AI we are, we, are, we are going towards, where instead of doing these different applications and are doing all of these different features, you simply will have to just start with taking a picture and then just speak to the AI about you know, what you need and the AI will be able to answer you because the AI will be strong enough to uh, be able to, to recognize a whole sort of like range of things instead of only being able to, to do a recognition of specific things. That's really neat and very exciting because I know I've definitely had the experience where you scan a menu or a document and then end up having to swipe right 50 times before you get to the information you're actually looking for. So I know that would be for me a huge time saver. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Karthik. And uh, we'll go over to Hans. Hans, what do you think about the future of AI and your technology? Well, <laughs> I would like to, I, I totally agree with, with what has been said here and, uh, and AI can do is a totally amazing thing. And, and, and when we can get AI to pick the right AI to get the next step, that, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's where we, we want to you know, go to. But, but if, if I think if we look a little further out, um, I mean, 
any computer screen is basically an image you're looking at. Um, so if we can get AI to uh, describe our uh, computer screen uh, and tell you uh, exactly what the buttons are, even if they are not labeled, uh, <laughs> that would be totally amazing. And uh, I think this would be super easy for AI to do that. And if we, on top of that, can kind of ask AI to uh, do things on the computer, uh, then suddenly we have a whole new level of uh, screen reading uh, and screen doing. Um, and I, I really think that AI can can, can do that in, in a very easy way. And not only for uh, blind users, but for any a person who is using a computer. And I think we, we all have uh, parents we are calling and helping in the weekends uh, because they get stuck on their computer and so on. But but if we can ha have a truly computer where you can simply talk and interact and ask the computer to do and they will actually do it, then, uh, then, then we have made a huge step, not only for blind people. And, and I think that is uh, some, Somewhere in in the pipeline, uh, which we should be able to do that, and and uh, and and that's what I what I hope for. Um, we will have a lot more audio controlled technology in in the future. Uh, absolutely. So. Sure. And I think something too that's really important about what Be My Eyes does, as well as it's fun to talk about all the technology and the um, impact it's going to have moving forward, but I think Be My Eyes really does kind of bring the human component into it as well, which is really cool. Um, giving people the opportunity to assist someone with a visual impairment and, and that kind of raising awareness worldwide. And that's something that I think is really important as we kind of move forward in this technological age and um, when we're relying on things like AI and computer technology to do a lot of things for us. so. I think that's an important uh, thing. On, on that note, um, we have, uh, and maybe that's also part of the reason why uh, OpenAI, they, they call it Be My Eyes, because uh, we have built into uh, this beta test that uh, if the OpenAI is not uh, more, uh, it's less than 95% uh, sure, then it will prompt you to call a human being <laughs> um, because uh, not always but most of the time it actually knows how sure it is about something and then it could say ah oh, maybe i'm not quite sure if you want to be real here about this please call a human being um and 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 that is i think a beautiful thing where uh, we can connect and, and use the strength of uh, humans and, and computers and and so on uh because ai can explain uh, something better than any human being can do uh, but sometimes it, it uh, it's completely off um and we need a, a real person to uh, to take care of this and also so far, uh, we cannot. We can only do this on 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 uh, still images. Um, we cannot do it on, on video. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you need to uh, get help uh, uh, with something that is uh, moving, or uh, can you find my my bird in my <laughs> in my apartment or something, then uh, you you will need a, a human being to 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 guide you around and also. Um, uh, like uh, turning on a washing machine or something, then you have a uh, uh, fourth question. Have I set it on uh, 40 degrees now? And then now you need to, to move it a little bit and so on. And that's not at the moment really possible to, uh, in a meaningful way to do with uh, taking images uh, after image and, and ask questions and so on. So, so sometimes it's really handy to have a human being, <laughs> uh, but other times um, technology can do an amazing job. So yeah, thank you. Sure, absolutely. It's good to know that we're not completely extinct as human beings yet. <laughs> well, I really appreciate the information that y'all have given us today. This has been so interesting and I know we are running short on time, but um, Lee, are there some commonly asked questions in the chat that more than one person wants to know about? We might be getting those first. Uh, there are. Um... Our panelists have done a great job of answering some of the questions while on this. 
Um, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to ask, let's see. Um, uh, Dawn asks, PDFs are a big accessibility challenge for blind and visually impaired users. Do you think that AI could be used to make PDFs accessible? Absolutely. No, I would agree as well. <laughs> I think it's, I think and even, uh, even we're doing uh, like an test. Oh, sorry. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah, so just uh, so like we were doing a test where we are sort of now you are combining output of, of the OCR with uh, some of the images there and there are some images that actually have like a graph or like a pie chart and things like that uh, and some of those a new AI that we have it is actually able to very accurately give descriptions of you know like you know, what's in a graph or like uh, your, your, or what's in a pie chart and things like that as well. Uh, so I think a lot of these uh, your, so inaccessible image based stuff that you often find in a PDF or in a book, I think uh, there's a big accessibility a wave that is sort of like, sort of like coming in terms of all of that because uh, the whole image recognition you know, game uh, with the onslaught of all of this, I would say, I would say the floodgate that open AI has opened, there's going to be a lot more image accessibility that's going to be made a possible which will also make your PDFs a lot more accessible going forward. If you, for instance, have a, 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 a flow chart, uh, then uh, uh, our version uh, can explain uh, that. And you can ask questions about uh, specific areas that you have interest in. Um, uh, and that is a, a totally amazing thing uh, that is otherwise absolutely uh, not uh, accessible <laughs> without having a, a human being there. So uh, AI can, can really do something. And please remember, uh, I mean, uh, AI is what? Uh, Eight, eight months old or something like that. It, it, it's um, it, it's really uh, early days. So uh, with, within a, a few years, we will have a, a whole new level of uh, AI understanding what we actually mean and, and, and uh, being able to, to explain it to us uh, in whatever language we want and so on. So, so it, it, it's uh, totally amazing, yeah. That is awesome. really exciting. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, this one's for Hans, and uh, we've had some people ask if they uh, if there's a way to get into the beta program or um, if there's any kind of way to do that. <laughs> I mean, we 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 have um, made it possible to to get on the wait list um, and. Um, I can tell you, <laughs> a lot of people uh, have uh, asked to <laughs> to come on on our waitlist. So we have, um, I mean, we have thousands of people who want to be uh, beta testers, uh, but but it's it's not meaningful for us to have that many uh, this early. So so we have this. I think we have uh, a little less than two hundred. That we are in in uh, close contact with and and ask them to to do things for us and so on and and get feedback, uh, but we we, could, we cannot handle uh, two thousand or more uh, beta testers as it is right now. So, but we will open up uh, slowly over the summer to to more people. I'm I'm not sure how many, but uh, but we will open up more. So. I think everybody's pretty excited about the prospect of. <laughs> this new feature coming out. <laughs> um, and I have a question for Karthik. Um, you answered it in the chat, which is great, but I think um, for people not looking at the chat, um, will the Ask Envision, Ask Envision feature be pushed to the Envision app as well, for instance, for people who may not have the glasses and just have the app? I uh, like, yes, that is uh, you know, like the goal we are already so already sort of working on optimizing the Ask and Vision to also be available for people who are only using the app. Uh, so yes, that will already be coming soon. I don't have a, have a timeline uh, for it, but the intention is to also have Ask and Vision uh, to be available on the app as well. Um, and I have a question for um, Michael that you also answered in the chat but I think would be useful for everyone. Um, and can the vibrations be used for those who are uh, deaf and blind? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. Yeah, um, 
yes, to, to answer that question, it, there are indeed vibrations. Um, so there's actually a lot of deaf blind people that are using our products. So there's, to emphasize again, there's three ways to get uh, feedback. One is audible, one is a vibration, and the third is of course a, a visual feedback. Uh, so for those that still want to maximize their risk visas, they look at their phone, whenever it lits up green or red, you know whenever the walk or don't walk signal is on. Um, so it's a bit like a user preference. Some you solely rely on a vibration, some on an audio, or just generally a combination of, of, of those things. And that was a really good question, because yeah, I think um, sort of like the principles of universal design say, you know, you make an adaptation or something that will assist in one particular area only to find out that it's actually useful across a far broader field than you originally mm -hmm. intended. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And I think what's also really cool, like I think it was a couple of weeks ago that Haben Girma uh, also made a video about our application, which was pretty cool. And she's also deaf blind herself. Um, so that also is like a good reference for those who want to see that video, I think, or it should be on YouTube somewhere. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. That's we fantastic. Um, we do. And we also have a few questions um, about uh, a recording for this and also for the transcript. And um, if you signed up for this uh, online, uh, we will be sending one um, hopefully tomorrow. Um, so you don't have to worry about getting the recording and the transcript. Um, and we have another question for Michael. Um, we've had a few people ask, does the iPhone have to be aimed at the traffic light or could you keep it um, in a carrier pouch and get the traffic crossing assistance? Yeah, that's indeed, I saw that question coming in right now as well, but there was <laughs> someone else asking as well. Yeah, that's a great question, I think how to carry the phone is I think one of the most important and critical things like how to properly use our technology. And that's something that we've been ed educating a lot. Um, but basically indeed the technology works with line of sight, which means basically that the camera needs to be able to see the traffic light across the street. Um, but it, there's actually two ways on, on how to, to use our app, whether it's one, you just use your, your own hand to carry the phone. Um, and it's always important to put the phone against the chest uh, at chest level. So that means the screen is against the chest and the back camera is pointing in the direction of travel, um, which ultimately is also more ergonomically for your hand, uh, but just generally also way more easy to, to capture that light across the street. But a lot of people for added ease of use or convenience, they also use some sort of like pouch or lanyard, which are they come in all sorts and it's pretty popular, for, not for only our app, of course. Um, so a lot of people also just carry their phone around the neck, um, have the app open when traveling to a certain city or just open it whenever you are at the intersection. It's again, a bit of personal preference, uh, whatever the person might like, um, but definitely the camera should always see the traffic light, of course, in order to get that information out. And, I, and there's someone actually already in the, <laughs> in the, the comments saying that she would recommend the lanyard. You can buy it on Amazon for 20 bucks. Indeed, they're coming in all sorts for different brands. So um, actually it's a lot of, I mean, a lot of people always ask like, can you recommend one for every other iPhone? We're still not there yet to have like one specific that really works because there's just so much, someone to have like sort of like waterproof, others do not want to have waterproof. So it's again, like a personal preference and. Um, but people can always reach out uh, if they found a, a great lanyard. So we can also tell others uh, in the community. Um, and we have one more question for Hans. I think you, you we already touched on this, but I just wanted to ask it um, because it's in the chat. Um, for the new, uh, AI assistance, do you have a choice with Be My Eyes if you have AI or if a volunteer will help you? <clears throat> yes, um, it will be big, big, uh, also, as I mentioned a little bit before, for some tasks, uh, it will be way better to have a human being. Uh, but sometimes early Monday morning, you don't want that. Um, or when you have like uh, maybe a, a flow chart, as I mentioned before, you want a 
uh, a written description that you can also uh, save for later and, and all that. Um, so, so there will be uh, two buttons where you can simply choose or to call a volunteer or you can choose to, to use the uh, AI option. Um, so that will absolutely be, be the case. So, yeah. Well, if anyone else has any last minute questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, well, while we're giving everybody a chance to submit any last minute questions, I just wanna say a great big thank you to all three of you, Michael, Hans, and Karthik. This has been absolutely fantastic today. I know I've been very interested and I think a lot of people have gotten a lot out of this. So we really appreciate your time and Kind of getting everybody together in one space has been a treat to say the least so thank you very much for joining us today and for what you do because it's you are so welcome. definitely you technology me. and mm. services that we all need and use on a daily basis and so we appreciate your innovation and your willingness to work on it yeah. thanks again for the opportunity and for all listeners tuning in yeah, no, I appreciate that as well, because I think, you know, like, I think all of us are, uh, are working in the field of AI for accessibility, but in different ways. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we are all very much aligned with the goals. And I think at the end of the day, it's all about offering people your choices. I think that's what we have always you know, believed in. Uh, you know, sometimes that when the AI is good for you, you go with the AI. Uh, sometimes you do need that human assistance, and then you always want to have that. So I think it's all about 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 having a choice and and us ensuring as much of a choice is available to people. So I think that's what all of us here are attempting to do, and it's pretty good to be on a panel where we have we have we have like like-minded you know, people who are all trying to work towards the same goal. And also, I want to say uh, I think this is true for all three of us that that we are working with. Uh, our users and and mm -hmm. uh, we have found I, I mean be my eyes would would not have been be my eyes without some very very uh, critical and and honest users in the beginning and and I think we have all uh, been there where we think we have made a, a genius solution and then we have some real users to to try it out and we realize oh maybe we wasn't that that smart <laughs> and, and we have to go back and improve the product and 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 this is what a real community to, can, can do, and and, uh, and and that is how we we, we need to all all to work and improve our products uh, is together with with our users. So, uh, and changes like this is uh, an amazing opportunity. Thank you. Did we have any more questions come through? Um, Michael, it looks like we um, we have one last question, and it might be good for you to kind of touch on it. Uh, someone asked, so when we are at the light, we need to point the camera at the pole across the street rather than the one next to us. Yeah, that's that's totally correct. Um, I think for all listeners, I think it's important to note that um, a lot of people open up the app whenever they're at the intersection. So whether you uh, use the truncated domes as a as a certain waypoint or the curb. It's at that moment that people open up the app and uh, hold it at against the chest level and then start scanning for pedestrian lights indeed across the street. So the pole across the street. Um, so that's totally correct. You should point in that direction as opposed to like going back uh, and try to capture the, uh, the traffic light in your, uh, yeah, in your back, let's say. And it's a great question. So thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say thank you so much for all of our panelists. Um, this has been a great discussion. Yeah, thank yes, you very much for really Karthik and Hans as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to have everybody here today, including all of our participants out there on Zoom. We appreciate you signing up and your attendance. And if there's any other questions that any of us can answer for you, please feel free to reach out. And hopefully we'll have some of you join us for our webinar next month. Yeah, if you have any any questions, you can email me at lrogers 
A-L-L-R-O-G-E-R-S at wsblind.org. Um, and I also put that in the chat just now. So um, we hope to see you guys next time. All right, super. Heather, Lee, thank you very much. And Karik and Hans, also thank you for joining in. Um, wish you all you. a wonderful day. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, cheers. Take thank care, everyone. You. Bye.